you spoke and time began. Thy thought and your command and by your word the earth began to move. All bound into with your hands, bring life into all men. You made it all, saw that it was good. There is no
Shining the light of Jesus. That's going to be our theme for VBS this summer. But as I was thinking about that, you know, one of the most effective ways that we can shine our light in this world is how we go through adversity, how we face difficulties. What do we do in the face 
of our enemies? Do we raise a hallelujah? Do we show peace that can't be shaken, a joy that can't be robbed, gratitude, thankfulness, even in the face of difficulties, love? What a testimony that makes when that's the evidence in our lives. And we can do that because the more we know our God, the more we realize He cannot be stopped. There's power in the name of Jesus. What a beautiful and wonderful name it is. So let's raise a hallelujah of praise together this morning as we continue. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. And I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. His promise is my remedy. And I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. We're going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. Lord, hear our praises a roar. Up from the ashes, I hope will arise. Death is defeated, our King is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah and I will watch the darkness beneath I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery and I raise a hallelujah Fear is lost, it's hold on me. We're going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, Lord, hear our praises a roar. And up from the ashes, our hope will arise. Then is defeated, our King is alive. a little louder in the presence of our enemies is a little louder louder than beyond belief sing a little louder his promise is a remedy is a little louder our God will fight for you and me sing a little louder in the presence of our enemies Raise a little louder, much louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder, His promise is a remedy. Raise a little louder, I praise for what the Christ our King. We're gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, Lord, hear our praises a roar. And up from the ashes, I hope will arise. Death is defeated, our King is alive. King is Dark tries to hide you, 
steal you away. Death tried to keep you inside of the grave. The enemy fought you, he tried but he lost. You cannot be stopped. When we cried for freedom, you tore down the walls. The weight of our burden, you carried it all. Our fears and our failures, Amen on a cross. You cannot be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. We stand on your victory and shout out your praise. Your miracle maker, your mighty to save. Your awesome in power, relentless in love. You cannot be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. No, there's, nothing there's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing, nothing. There's nothing that can Stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. Over a mountain, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah. The battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won, but nothing can stand against our God. Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? All the world can come to Him to have their sins removed. Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Jesus beautiful 
Son of God, one of us, lover of our souls. Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Eternal King, you will reign forever. And we will sing the glory of your name. Be lifted high. For all the world to see, your name is all they need, your name is all we need. Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Chains are broken when it's spoken, every knee must bow. Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Eternal King, you will reign forever. And we will sing the glory of your name. Be lifted high. There's healing in the name, there is power in the name, salvation in the name, there is life in the name, there is no other name but Jesus, Jesus. There is freedom in the name, there's the name, there is power in the name, salvation in the name, there is life in the name, there is no other name but Jesus, Jesus. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, our King. What a powerful name it is, that nothing can stand against, the name of Jesus Christ, our King. What a wonderful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ our King, the name of Jesus Christ our King, the name of Jesus Christ our the name of Jesus all we need. Isn't the name of Jesus all we need. He's the way, the truth, the life, the only way to God. Isn't the name of Jesus all we need. Stuart Briscoe, famous pastor, uh, talks about an incident he had when 
he was the, in his first week at the Elmbrook Church. He said, a woman came up after the service and asked me if I would find the answer to a technical question she had about a particular Bible text. I replied, no, I will not. The woman got shocked and a look on her face and she, as if she didn't hear him correctly. And, and, and what? No, I said, I will not find the answer to your question. She looked at him as if to say, uh, what are we paying you for? And he continued, he said, but here's what I will do. I will show you how to find the answer for yourself. And she, he proceeded to do that. One writer says, in that exchange, Pastor Briscoe was following a sound biblical philosophy of ministry based on the text for today. Rather than doing the ministry for that woman, he was equipping her to do the ministry for herself so that she would grow into Christian maturity. You see, there's been a word added to Christianity for hundreds of years now. And it's one of the worst words possible for the spiritual vitality of any church. Clergy. That's a horrible, unbiblical word. Clergy. There are clergy. And then you people. The laity. <laughs> John Stott uh, he said in his uh, work, One People, he quotes a guy named Sir John Lawrence, and this is what Sir John Lawrence said a typical church is like. What does the layman really want? He wants a building which looks like a church, and he wants clergy dressed in a way that he approves, and he wants services of the kind that he's used to. And after that, he wants to be just left alone. There's been a tremendous divide in Christianity about this. There's somehow this idea that there's clergy who do ministry, and then there's you guys. There's nothing in the Bible to support that at all. In fact, we're going to look at a scripture today that's going to talk directly to it. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, we'll look at verse 6 before we started the text at verse 7. Remember, two weeks ago, we were talking about how do we get along with people? How do we walk with people? And I said we had these stepping stones, that we had to walk with humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance and loving one another. When he got to the end of that section, Paul says in verse 4, there's only one body, one spirit, just as you were called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There's a lot of alls in there. But then he starts, stops immediately where we go with the text today. But, in spite of all that, but to each one. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. The first point I want to make is God gifts all of us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have at least one, and many more maybe, spiritual gifts. He gives each one of us a spiritual gift. And notice here, the term he uses is, each one of us, grace was given. And this isn't about salvation. This is something different. This is God's self-motivated, self-generated, sovereign act of giving and it's based on the last word of the verse, which is gift. He gives us all a particular spiritual gift. Hmm. Hold your place here and go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4. Again, the Apostle Paul Now notice, he says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Each one given a manifestation of the Spirit 
for the common good. Every person who knows Christ in this room has a spiritual gift, at least one. Now I want you to go with me to 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. Peter will give us a little more light on this idea. Peter writes, as each one has received a special gift. Notice again, each one and is special. As each one, he says, has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. <coughs> Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. What's so wonderful in there about what Peter says is there's two kinds of gifts. There's speaking gifts and there's serving gifts. And each one of us have gifts. Each and every one. Now back to the Ephesian passage. Each one of that. Now what's really interesting about this is that if you look in the New Testament, you'll find three extensive gifts listed. Three lists of extensive gifts. None of them are the same. So it's not like, oh, there's one list and he just show it three times. No, they're, they're all different. Everywhere in the New Testament, the gifts are different. And I think that's the point. You see, I don't think it's a matter of how the gifts work in the sense that there's only a few and you've got to figure out what is yours. This whole interest in spiritual gifts, by the way, in the church is like the phases of the moon. Okay, it's either waxing or it's waning. Uh, we live in a waning phase. Okay, spiritual gifts are almost never, ever talked about today at all. We don't talk about that. But in the 80s, oh, my goodness. In the 80s, they had conferences just on spiritual gifts, books written on spiritual gifts. You could take test after test after test, and the test will tell you what your spiritual gift is. I mean, it was amazing. You like walk up, my name's Bill, and my spiritual gift is. But I think that misses the point. You don't find your spiritual gift by testing. You find your spiritual gift by walking with the Lord. You find your spiritual gift by loving other people. And whenever you love other people, in the way in which you're most effective, God says, that's a gift I've given you. It makes sense because there's only one body and not all of us can be the mouth or something like that. And every part of the body is important. So from God's point of view, every single believer is important and every single believer has a spiritual endowment or gift from God, which is to be used for the benefit of everybody. Hmm. It's an interesting thing. Let's go back to the Ephesians passage again. Each one was given according to the measures of Christ's gift. So God gives all of us a spiritual gift, and Christ has the right to give us gifts. That's why he gave us gifts. That's why Paul's thinking about this is very unusual. Verse 8 says, Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Okay, that's a, a very loose paraphrase of Psalm 68, a passage in Psalm 68. And it's pretty loose. Paul's just he's talking about two different things there. But Psalm 68 is called the victory psalm. The idea is behind the, the winning of it is the victor. Now, if you remember, Roman culture was just like Jewish culture back in the days of David and Solomon. But whenever Rome had a victory, they would take the spoils from their victory and then they would march them down the street in Rome and the prisoners. They would lead them and down the street and show this is what we've just won. This is now our right. These things belong to us. And so Paul uses this analogy. He ascended on high. He led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. I won the victory, and I want to give you the gifts. That's the analogy that Paul is using. Now it gets a little bit more difficult to understand right here. He said, now this expression, he ascended, 
What does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. Um, there has been enormous amount of uh, debate over what does that mean? What does it mean? Some of the scholars say it means when he descended, he descended from heaven and came to earth, and then he ascended back again. Others say, no, no, it means something other. He, he came to earth, but he descended into the grave, and then from their resurrection, he ascended back into heaven. Still others say that when he descended into the grave, he visited the spirits now in the abyss or in prison from Genesis 6 who tried to stop the seed of Eve from ever coming and proclaimed to them his victory. Uh, here's my thought. Take your choice. Okay? Just pick the one that you think makes most sense to you, and you're in good stead because there's some really fine people who would believe uh, just as, as you do. It's just an amazing thing the way it worked out from that point of view. And so uh, uh, he says what he's trying to say is simple. He has the right to give us gifts. He's won the victory. That part is assured. And so he starts out. And he said he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Now, this is an interesting section. These are... Jesus gifts to the church at large. These are the gifts that he gave the church at large. The first two gifts are what we would call our foundational gifts to the church. When the church began, this laid the foundation. That's what their job was. They were to receive and declare the revelation of God. The apostles, for example, not only were evangelists as well, as we know with Paul and others, but they were able to confirm their ministry with signs and wonders, just like Jesus did. They laid the foundation. The need for the prophets in the early church is quite clear. Is the church a very different entity than Israel in the Old Testament? Yes, it's completely different. Spirit of God indwells God's people. We make up one body. It's a completely different thing. Well, how much of the New Testament did we have when the church began? Zero. There was no New Testament. So there was no way of knowing. So God that gifted prophets to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, so that they would know. Now, as the word of God became written, the prophets sat down. We didn't need the prophets. God has now told us in the New Testament era, he's told us what his will is for the church. But the foundation of both of those things, he said, is really, really clear here. They were the apostles and the prophets. And then he gives two other gifts that continue to this day, or three, depending on how you read it, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Okay, the evangelist is pretty simple. It's people who have a gift to evangelize. New Testament, Philip. In fact, guess what his name is, or his description. Philip, the evangelist. Okay, now we've had guy, Billy Graham, the evangelist. There are people that have a gift of evangelism. And by the way, if you have a close friend who has the gift of evangelism, uh, you feel guilty all the time. Because they'll always tell you every single encounter. Uh, Mick and Rick Vignell, who are the twins that we supported for many years in ministry, uh, they did youth work all over the country, all over the world, as a matter of fact. And even when you'd pick them up at the airport, they would begin sharing with me how they were trying to lead people to Christ on the plane. The store, you know, the, the, the server, they talked to them. Ticket taker, talked to them. They met a guy sitting downtown, went in the bathroom, talked to a guy about the Lord. You know, every, and it's like, and it's amazing because you just keep thinking, what am I doing? You know, these people see every single opportunity that comes as a chance to evangelize. They have a gift. That doesn't mean we don't evangelize, but we fall under more of the category that Peter wrote about, that if somebody asks us, we need to give an account for the hope that's in us. We need to be a witness for Jesus Christ. So evangelists have always been needed in the church. The second part of this says pastors and teachers. The question is this, are these two groups or one? Uh, 
From a Greek point of view, you would probably want to say this is one. But certainly the teacher would be the same thing. You know, I'll say in a minute, all pastors have to be teachers. If you're not a teacher, you can't be a pastor. That word pastor means that's the idea. It's a, and by the way, the word's pumin. And in every place it's used in the New Testament except right there, it's always translated shepherd. It's never translated pastor. That's a, that's a word we kind of made up and put in there as pastor. <laughs> shepherd teachers. That's the way this works. And he says, so he says, some as pastors and teachers. Now, so the idea is Christ has the right to give gifts, and he gives it. And now the most important part is that uh, why? What's the role of these foundational people, pastors and teachers and evangelists? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry to the building up of the body of Christ. Wow. Now I'm going to show you something here, how ingrained clergy is into the mindset since the Reformation. I'm sure it came out of the Reformation, probably out of Catholicism eventually, a total separate group. The King James translators here violate the Greek text completely, knowing better. Here's, how they, here's what they say about that verse. For the equipping of the saints, comma, that's one. For the work of the ministry, that's, or service, that's two. And for the building up the body of Christ, three. That's the three, that's their three responsibilities. You can't put a comma. With the Greek the way it is, you can't put a comma after the idea that the equipping of the saints, comma. It's the equipping of the saints for the work of service. But they had such an idea that clergy do that that they just put a comma in it and said, there you go. There is the work of the ministry for the equipping of the saints, katartismos, to make them fit, to make them fit for ministry. That's what all the gifts are for. You see, there's going to be something here that we're going to be able to see. The reason we use all the gifts is not just a testimony to the world. The reason we use all these gifts is because of God's primary goal in each and every one of your lives. You have to grow. You have to grow. Growing is not an elective to Christianity. Christianity is not a religion. Why well, choose? I'm not going to ever grow. I'm just going to heaven when I die. Well, I'm, you will go to heaven maybe when you die, but maybe sooner than you thought if you think that way. The point of it is you have to grow. We have to mature. That's part of the process. Romans talks about it. We have to become conformed to the image of Christ. You see, and that's why we need all the gifts around us. Let me give you an example. Do you ever feel like just quitting? I mean, whatever it is, I'm done. I'm pretty sure you have. And if you haven't, you have a problem with truth, okay? <laughs> There's a different issue there. But what do you need when you're really down like that? You need encouragement. What's one of the spiritual gifts? An encourager. You need someone to encourage you. Every gift is like that. Sometimes we get overwhelmed with something that is just the physical amount of work that needs to be done. And there are people who have the gift of service. They just come in, wipe, roll up their sleeves and say, let's do it. Let me get going. There are other times when you find yourself struggling. I don't know if I really can believe this or that. And you talk to someone who has a gift of faith. And they say, no, let me tell you, I, this is how firm I am on what I believe. All these gifts work together to help you and I grow. That's the point of it. And that's why he said, when he said it, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, the building up of the body of Christ. That's exactly what builds us up. And so... That's the reason we do all this. Now from down to verse 16, when God gives and equips the saints for ministry, there are tremendous benefits for all of us. And he just lists the benefits right here. First benefit, until we all attain the unity of the faith, until we all attain the unity of the faith. 
of all the things that Paul talks about in all the letters, the one that gets the least amount of attention from us is how big it is for him that there's unity in the body of Christ. He, he says that more than anything else. There can't be disunity. And we kind of live in a country, by the way, that promotes disunity at every level possible. Every person's their own intellectual island. I have my opinion, and that's all there is to it. And so consequently, it doesn't fit well with an American mindset. But Paul says, look, whenever we grow spiritually, we become unified in our faith. And if you look at the history of the church, even since the Reformation, if I said to you, has this church shown tremendous unity? You'd have to say what? Absolutely not. I mean, that's the whole point of churches. I mean, you can, it's just like a smorgasbord. You know, there's any possible group. Why? Because we don't agree with those people and not those people or that people or that group over there either. So he says we can all attain the unity of the faith, which is an extremely important thing. In other words, there's a doctrinal maturity to us. Secondly, and the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, this is different. The word knowledge there is not the typical word in the New Testament for knowledge, which is gnosis. Once again, Paul uses the word epinosis. Epinosis, if I was going to use it in a slang way, could almost be like super knowledge. It means intense relational knowledge. It means intimacy. And so until we all attain this knowledge of Christ, this isn't, oh, I know all about Christ. I know he was the son of God. I know that, and I know he lived a sinless life, and I know he died on the cross as my substitute. And I know that, so I guess I'm going to heaven, and I know all that. I know Christ. That's not, that's not epinosis. Epinosis is really knowing Christ. Let me show you something. Uh, hold your place and go with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. In the beginning of Philippians 3, Paul brags about his religious background. And he says, look, if religion did anything for you, I have a lot to brag about. I'm a Jew. I'm a circumcised male. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm not just of the, which is the best tribe. I'm not only a Benjamite. I'm a Pharisee. Oh, I'm, by the way, I'm not just a Pharisee. I'm the Pharisee of Pharisees. And in fact, the other thing you could add, and I'm not taught by anybody. I'm taught by the rabbi Gamal the leading teaching rabbi in Judaism. And Paul says, look, he says in verse 7, but whatever things I gained were gained to me, I've counted them but lost for the sake of Christ. They don't mean anything. He said, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Epinosis of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, that I might gain Christ. Uh, the word rubbish is kind. It's not rubbish. It's better translated probably dung. Okay, but they didn't want to use that word, so they used the word rubbish. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, he said, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, same idea, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being comforted to his death, in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may hold of that which he said also I was laid hold of by Jesus Christ. Brethren, I do not regard myself of laying hold of it yet, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind reaching forward to what lies ahead pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said there's so much more to Christianity. If you really know Christ, it changes everything. It's the most maturing factor of a Christian. There are Christians who know him, all about him. That's what Paul said. And notice, he's the great apostle and says, I haven't attained it yet, but I'm pressing on. That should be our idea. The whole idea, the knowledge, the unity of faith and the knowledge of Christ. Back to the Ephesians. So after he says all that, he says, and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. 
the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Do you ever think of yourself that way? Paul says all of our goals is to be a spiritually mature man. Hmm. I hate to say this, but most of us are not. Most Christians are not mature. And I think they're fine with it. And that's a problem. They don't have this motivation that Paul talks about. This is my motivation. Because a mature man to Paul was one who was conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. You see, I think a lot of us are a little bit more like what the recipients of the letters to the Hebrews was like. Again, hold your place and go with me to Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5 and verse 11. Now, the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell people about some things. And he realizes when he's writing, he's wasting his breath or his ink. He wants to tell them about Melchizedek. And here's the look on their face. Well, there it is. Here's the look on their face. Mel who? Who? Now, watch what he writes. He says... Concerning him, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. I don't want to waste my time here. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. This is about 20 years, by the way. The writer of Hebrews said, by now you should be a teacher. You've been a believer for 20 years. He said, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk. And not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. He's an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. He said, I'm still feeding you baby food. 20 years later, we're still doing baby food. You should be meat eaters by now. You see, that's the analogy that he's doing. The expectation of God is that you grow. That's God's expectation for you and me, that you grow. The real question is, is that your expectation for yourself? Now, back to Ephesians. He said we become mature believers. And then, after that, he says in 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, and by craftiness and deceitful scheming. What's it mean? If you're mature, you're discerning. You're discerning. By the way, the church has never been threatened as it is today with a lack of discernment and the consequences of it. Most of the time in the ancient world, the only person who ever had access to even to the word of God was usually the pastor teacher. You lived in a village and went to a village church, and the only person you ever heard talk about the Bible would have been a pastor teacher. What about today? So you can go home and just start flicking channels. You see? And guess what? Many of them are false teachers. They're just telling you lies. Can you discern it, though? Are you discerning? Or it's just like, wow. And I know some of you struggle with it because you'll come up to me and say, I heard so-and-so say this. What do you think? Well, I think it's heresy. Oh, yeah, okay. I mean, you should be discerning. When you're maturing, you become discerning. Again, almost every epistle Paul says to the church is this. Be discerning, be discerning, be discerning. You have to know what the truth is. And as someone said many years ago, a lady in the church, just because their lips are moving doesn't mean it's the gospel. You see, and I can still remember her saying that, but the point of it is we have to be discerning people. And he said that's what will end up happening to you if you're discerning. He said, then the last thing, he says, but speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love love. If I'm going to speak the truth, what's important? You have to know. 
what the truth is. You see, it's interesting. We receive the truth, we embrace the truth, then we understand the truth, and then we speak the truth. That's God's intention, always has been. You and I are to be truth carriers, but you have to know the truth. See, Jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But the truth is, is what people need desperately in their lives. Somebody has to tell them the truth. You see, that becomes, in a sense, the modus operandi of, of the church and always has been. I love what Paul writes to Timothy. He says this, And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The multiplication factor. Whatever you, truth you heard from me, Timothy, you teach to other men who will teach others. I had a really exclamation point, point on this point, considering what I was going to say today, was yesterday I got a phone call from a friend that I had in Pennsylvania, in western Pennsylvania, in our home church. And this is a, a long, I was in my mid-20s. And one of their leaders who speaks and teaches the men's ministry there He's doing men's ministry. He's talking about how important it is to have a spiritual mentor to help you that you can know and mentor other people. And he said, uh, and my mentor, I would have never known this, is Bill Gebhardt. Now, I was in my mid-20s, and he said, I remember attending his Bible study, and I remember how he was answered all the questions I had afterwards, how he got me so uh, on fire for the Word of God, now, this is a long, long time ago, but he remembered. And it, made, it was a very encouraging thing to me because this wasn't, this is pre-seminary, pre-anything. This is just a 20-some-year-old doing the best he can. But the point of it is, that's our, that is our ministry. That's what we're supposed to be able to do, speak the truth. Now, think of that. that that's an amazing thing when you think about all these characteristics, the unity of faith, the relational knowledge of Christ, mature believers, we become discerning, and we speak the truth in love. And then notice what he says right after that. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into who he is the head, even Christ. What would Paul tell us today? Grow up. You have to grow up. And he says, look, I'm making it easy for you. First of all, I'm giving you supernatural gifts to serve other people. That's pretty cool. Oh, well, don't get too excited about this. And I've given you a pastor teacher to teach you the word of God. You see what I mean? He said, I'm giving you what you need. And in our day and age, we have everything. Oh, my goodness. We have access to all kinds of truth everywhere we can get it. We can bring it up instantly on our phone. He said, then why aren't we growing up? You see, that's what we have to be able to do in that sense as a church. <laughs> that's what the church should be. One writer concluded this way. He said, the growth of the church is not a result of clever methods, but every member of the body fully using his spiritual gift in close contact with other believers. Christ is the source of the life and power and growth of the church, which he facilitates through each believer's gifts and mutual ministry in joints teaching other believers. The power of the church flows from the Lord through the individual believers and relationships between believers. Where his people have close relationships of genuine spiritual ministry, God works. And where they have no intimacy at all with each other and are not faithful to each other's gifts, God cannot work. He does not look for creativity, ingenuity, or cleverness, but a willing and loving obedience. The physical body functions properly only as each member in union with the other members responds to the direction of the head to do exactly what it was designed to do. Hmm. Simple message. Two questions to just leave you with. The first one. Do you realize how God has gifted you to serve others? You have to answer that for the question. Do you, how has God gifted you to serve others? Have you come to a realization about that? Have you prayed about that? Look at the list of gifts that are in Scripture. There's more than that, but just look at them. But ask yourself the question, do I realize what my gift is? 
here at all. And secondly, and maybe even more importantly, am I a growing Christian? What I mean by that over these last years, can you see your growth? Do you see you maturing? Do you see your spiritual life as starting out in a nursery and then going through preschool and then working your way? Do you see yourself as a maturing Christian? These are two absolutely essential questions for every single believer. Because if you do that, it's not only better for us, it's much better for you. You see, that's the point. That's what Paul wants to tell us. We must grow up. Let's pray. Father, I don't know, Father, if we think about these topics near enough. I don't know if we delude ourselves into thinking we are what we're not. But I know, Father, there's a need. Everyone in this room needs everybody else. We need believers around us to be able to fill the gaps in our life that we can't fill ourselves. This is the way you designed us. We cannot live as Christianity as an island. Father, also, that we have to ask ourselves, am I growing as a Christian? And I love what the writer says. If we mature as a Christian, you can see our maturity not by how we think or talk, but how we act. It's our actions that reveal our maturity, not our thoughts. Challenge us this day, each and every one of us, with your truth. What are our spiritual gifts? And am I a growing Christian? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good